Welcome to the 76 Capital Leadership Series. I'm your host, Wayne Kimmel. I'm also Managing Director of 76 Capital and the Chairman of our 76 Capital Sports Advisory Business, which does incredible things in and around the sports industry. And we're just excited to have a great guest today. We have Hall of Famer, NHL Hall of Famer, Chris Pronger coming on our show. Uh, super excited to talk hockey with Chris, talk about life, talk about business, talk about all the things that he's doing right now, and just have a, have a great conversation all about, you know, just all about making it happen. You know, you think about what's going on, and, and you know, right now we're taping the show on 9-11 in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, you know, you think about toughness and compassion and caring and pain and love and persistence and all the things that we all need as a, as a society to make it through all these tough things. And uh, I'm excited to talk to Chris about some of those things that made him an incredible hockey player, business person, husband, um, you know, father, all the great things that he's done in his career. Uh, excited to go over all, all those types of things. And as you know, at 76 Capital, we're all about investing in smart and nice and passionate entrepreneurs that are doing the next, next thing in sports. We want to think about working with and we're all about working with the entrepreneurs that are trying to make the impossible possible. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, trying to figure out that and try to do things that are really, truly making things happen in this world. So, you know, you can follow us at 76 Capital on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, as well as subscribing to our 76 Capital Leadership Series on YouTube. And also, we are now... Um, our 76 Capital Leadership Series is also on podcast, so you can listen to our, our, our podcasts on Spotify, on Apple, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. So we're really excited to be able to share all the things that we've done on our 76 Capital Leadership Series with you, all about looking to inspire this next generation of entrepreneurs who want to do big things in the sports industry. We want to meet you reach out to us, listen to some of the things that we, we do, listen to the great guests, the entrepreneurs, the athletes, the executives in and around the sports world that we bring onto our show where they're giving you some great advice as to what they've done in their careers and how you could be just like them in the future. So without a further ado, I want to bring on our special guest today, Chris Pronger. Um, I'm super excited to have you on the show, Chris. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Wayne. Uh, it's amazing, Chris. You know, you're, you were the, one of the most dominant and, quite frankly, most feared defensemen uh, in, in the history of the NHL. And, uh, you know, I've, I, you know, I, I know you as a, as a guy with always a smile on your face, but, man, I, I certainly wouldn't want to have to line up, you know, across from you on the, on the ice. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think when, you, when you're playing a sport, and especially a physical sport like I played, you know, there's that switch that uh, – uh, it's it's game time and and you know whether it's putting the gear on and that's when you flip the switch or it's when your blades hit the ice uh, for us with uh, in hockey you know there's something that happens when you make that transformation and you start playing the game and and friendships and all the rest of that stuff kind of go out the window and and you just get immersed in the the sport you get immersed in the game and the competition and and trying to win. And, uh, you know, I certainly played uh, a, a style that was loved in Philly, that's for sure. But, uh, uh, you know, I I only know how to play the game one way. And, and it just, you know, when I started getting my equipment on, that's just the way I played. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I think I like to hold uh, my teammates accountable, but, but also uh, hold my opponents accountable for, uh, you know, whether it's defending and, and they're trying to score on us or, uh, or vice versa. And I think as you look through my career and look through um, the way you're able to kind of step back and, and look at your career afterwards and, and do you ever have anything you wish you didn't do or wish you were able to do and accomplish? And, and I've been fortunate enough to play on a lot of great teams with a lot of great players. And, and uh, you know, I've got no regrets. I left it all on the ice. And I think that as an athlete and as a player, uh, that's all you want to be able to leave the game with is that you have no regrets and, and you left it all out there and you didn't have that one moment where you wish you would have gave a little bit more or wish you would have been able to do something else or do do more to to uh, make more of an impact on your team on your on your teammates on the organization on the city that you lived in and played in so um, you know I think for us uh, as a family and and me as as an athlete 
and former athlete, I'm able to look myself in the mirror and say, I left it all on the table. Well, that's amazing. We're really excited to have you um, on our show. It's, it's great to have Chris Pronger on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. You know, Chris, you played for the Hartford Whalers or drafted by them, right? You went to the play for the St. Louis Blues, the Edmonton Oilers, the Anaheim Ducks, won a Stanley Cup with them, played with the uh, Philadelphia Flyers, where I, you were also an executive um, with the uh, Florida Panthers. Uh, now you're an entrepreneur and building a, a luxury travel business with your wife uh, called Well Inspired Travels. So I'm really excited about, you know, want to, want to get into that. But one of the things that we love to do on our 76 Capital Leadership Series is go way back, go all the way back to your childhood yep. uh, and talk about, you know, what was it, what was it like growing up and, 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 and were you always thinking about becoming a professional hockey player? Were there other sports that you played or were there other things that you kind of thought about as, as a young person? Yeah, you know what? I, you know, I always dreamed of playing the NHL, but I played, you know, growing up as a kid, I played baseball in the summer. I played golf. I played uh, a little bit of soccer. Um, you know, I really kind of played the sport of the season. And uh, I wasn't really immersed in the mindset that uh, at a young age, I only need to play one sport. I was a, a multi-sport athlete and, and, you know, played volleyball, played, uh, as I said, anything that was kind of going on at that particular time, you know, obviously during the winter and, and in Canada where I'm from, it's a much, it's a very long winter. <laughs> so hockey was kind of the main sport because of the, the length of, of the winter season. But uh, uh, I, I tried to, immerse myself in, in any sport really that uh you know i was, it was just for me it was all about competition all about being able to uh compete and play against uh players and, and try to win you know I, to me it was about trying to win and trying to get better whether it was playing baseball basketball hockey golf soccer you know playing marbles uh, on the <laughs> on the on the uh the uh at, at middle school or, or uh, you know, it just, it really, to me, didn't matter. I just wanted to compete for something. And you always want to test yourself against, uh, at, this, at this point, other kids. But uh, as you get older against, uh, you know, your competitors and, and you know, other athletes that, uh, that you're trying to better on, on any given day. And what was it like kind of on, on the home front? I, I understand your brother also was a, was a heck of a hockey player. He was, you know, and I think it was great for me having an older brother. You know, he he was a lot bigger than I was at, you know, back then. So wait a second, you you were you played you were six six two twenty in in the NHL. How big is your was your brother? Uh, well, he was he's six three two two hundred two hundred five. So I think when you look at uh, um, when you look at him and. His size as a younger kid, I was tall and skinny. He was very uh, hefty, you might say. He was thick uh, as a younger kid, and and uh, you know, I get you, you're playing against older kids. You know, he was two years older, but we had played against three, four, five years older than than I was. You got to, you know, in order to play back then in those days, you got to keep up with those bigger kids, and you got to be able to match up against them, and and not embarrass yourself and not, um, you know, so you learn real quick how to compete and how to play against that older group. So then as I grew and got bigger and bigger, I was able to kind of then use my leverage, use my skill set, my size to my advantage and, and never really feel uh, out of sorts against, you know, as I got 15, 16, 17, I, I, had, I had already trained myself to learn how to uh, – yeah. <laughs> that's a fresh picture right there. I had already trained myself how to, uh, you know, really use my advantages to to uh, allow myself to compete at a high level and, and use hey, it as an edge. So for our, for our podcast, people that are listening, tell describe the picture that's on the screen right now. <laughs> Who is that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure who the guy in the middle is. Yeah. So my brother's on, as you're looking at the screen, my brother's on the right. I'm on the left. I got to be honest with you. I don't even know how old I am there. Uh, it looks like. I mean, from the clothes, it's got to be like 
80s ish or something. No, no, it's you know it's probably mid nineties. I mean, mid nineties, maybe not mid nineties. Mid nineties. St. Yeah. Louis jersey on. I have to imagine this is maybe my first year in St. Louis. Okay. Um, you know, as you can tell, the suits aren't going to made to order. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that I think that might be my rookie year in St. Louis, or if not at the very latest it's my so it might be 95 or 96 but uh so your brother played in the league too right my brother played uh you know 10 10 years he played in anaheim you know he played all over he played on 14 different teams so you know he wrote a book called the journeyman basically talking about you know you you've got my career and even in my career i moved five times so you've got my career and you got a hall of famer and then you have my brother's career where he was a you know he called himself the journeyman and and, uh, you know, moved around a lot, to, whether it was in the minors, getting called up and down, or or even in the pros. I, there was one year where he played on five different teams, three in the NHL and two in the minors. So uh, it's not always <laughs> about the glory and the fame and fortune. And it's about the, the passion you have for the sport and, and your willingness to continue to strive to get to where you want to be and, and to reach your goals. And, um, you know, I think – you know, I always talk about adversity and and the forks in the road, and you know, are you are you going to quit or are you going to push through and and find a way? And uh, you know, I know there's a number of of speakers that are out there that that talk about those types of metaphors and those type of of ideas, and it, it's so very true. We, we all run into for whether it's business, sports, life. There's always that fork in the road. There's always the decision to be made. Am I going left? Am I going right? Am I pushing through or am I going to quit? And, uh, and really it, it, it helps at a young age when you go through stuff like that, you're able to really find out who you are. You're able to really figure out how competitive you are, um, how determined you are to, whether it's to be good, whether it's to be great, whether it's to be elite, whether it's to be, you know, the highest possible, uh, you know, the elite of the elite the hall of famer, the, the best ever, you know, there's always that another notch, or if you're in the conversation for best ever, it's well, how, what's going to differentiate me. And you're always, you always got to find that nugget that's going to push you even harder. And uh, you know, that's always something that I, I always did. I always trained in the off season and, and worked on my deficiencies and my weaknesses, but I also didn't uh, lose sight of what I was good at and I always continue to, to add to those and, and try to add to my repertoire so that I wasn't always a one trick pony and, and an easy uh, player to defend against or an easy player to come against uh, in, in the, in the defensive sense um, you're able to always add to what you do. And, and again, I always say it, it doesn't matter if it's life, business, sports, all of these hold true for everything that we do in life. Tremendous advice. And we're here with Chris, Chris Pronger on our 76 capital leadership series NHL Hall of Famer, uh, incredible career, you know, win winning an NHL uh, Stanley Cup member, you know, you're, it's incredible. I saw I was reading this and I, I hadn't even hadn't really heard of this this term. Um, you're in this exclusive triple uh, triple gold <laughs> club, a Stanley Cup, an Olympic gold medal and a world championship. Uh, absolutely incredible. You know, I think one of the things that we talk about, you know, on our on our 76 Capital Leadership Series is how you know, how did you you get there? Um, was there a, a, a mentor, a friend, um, a teammate, or someone that gave you sort of a piece of some some a piece of advice, or pushed you a little harder, or or made you really think about being you know to help you become you know as great as you were able to become on the ice? Yeah, I think you know I think when you hear the term, it takes a village. You know, I I think I really do believe that. There's always people, I'm from a super small town in the middle of nowhere, Canada. Uh, I'm sure they're not gonna be happy I'm saying that. <laughs> but Northwestern Ontario is not exactly a hot spot for people to go to, other than to fish. And there it is. Uh, great tourism spot, great fishing spot, uh, but you know, six, 7,000 people. And growing up, obviously with no internet at the time, and, and you, know, you get a, a weekly hockey digest, you get, uh, you know, a monthly biblical on hockey and whatnot. You're you're limited to what you see on TV and watching the sports Saturday nights for Hockey Night in Canada. And as you kind of 
go through all that and and growing up in that small town you have coaches that kind of take a they see something in you i had a high school coach jack mcmaster who saw something in me who had played university hockey in canada and and you know was a pretty good player in his own right and and he saw something in me and and worked with me in practice and and really kind of took my raw skill set and really started to develop and hone it. And, and then, you know, as I went on to play junior hockey, I had coaches that worked with me. And, and then I had coaches in Peterborough when I played major junior, there was a fresh uh, 16 year old right there. <laughs> and uh, thanks for bringing all these treats out. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, my, you know, my producer and chief of staff, James Santor, you know, is amazing at this. And he's digging, he's digging deep to find these, you know, when I was in Peterborough, Jeff Tui was our assistant coach, and Dick Todd was our head coach. They'd have they had a number of of star players come through the program, and and you know they saw something in me and and worked. I you know you have to be willing to put in the work, but you also have to have people that are willing to to stick around and and help you develop and help you help guide you and navigate the pressures and and. Um, you know, the, at this point in, in Peterborough, there was a lot of eyes on me and, and, you know, they, they did a great job in trying to shield me from a lot of that and just focus, uh, on playing the game and, and, and developing my skills and developing my talent. And then as you move on into, into the pro ranks after Peterborough, I get to Hartford and, and Brad McCrimmon, who was, uh, was brought in to help mentor me. And, and, uh, you know, there's a young Brian Burke. <laughs> so a young, uh, you know, an old Brad McCrimmon comes in to mentor this fresh faced kid and, you know, snot nosed little punk and, and you know, kind of walk me through, you know, what it's like to be a professional, how you need to act, what you need to do, how you prepare and practice and prepare in games and, and, and walk me through the day to days. And as an 18, 19 year old kid, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever beast. And sure enough, you know, as you get a little bit older and you experience all the ups and downs and, as I said, the different adversities that you're going to face, you then realize like, oh, just like your parents, you know, you realize, oh, they do know what they're talking about, <laughs> you know, and everything that he said has come true, you know, whether it's about the sport, about being a professional, about handling the media, about, you know, all the things that he tried to walk me through and, and you know, in a complimentary way in a uh, mindful manner of, of trying to help me and help guide me. And, and, you know, not very, uh, you know, I roomed with him as 36 year old man and uh, uh, rooming with this 18, 19 year old kid. Uh, you know, I'm sure it wasn't exactly his ideal <laughs> roommate at 36 years old, taking care of a kid when he's got two kids at home. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, as you look back, as I grew and developed into the player that I became, you look back on those moments and go, wow, he, you know, that's who you want to be when you get older and, and help kids kind of come into the league and, you know, that you can use the pay it forward term, or you can, you know, you can really teach them a lot about being a professional, a lot about being a pro athlete, a lot about, um, you know, understanding the game, understanding life, you know, on and on and on. And, you you know, as a young player in the league, there's so much going on and so much thrown at you. You need veteran leadership like that around you to kind of help guide you and, and just almost slow you down so that you can actually soak it all in and sponge it up. There's so much information being thrown at you and so much going on, uh, especially in today's world with social media and marketing. And it's such it's at such a bigger level now than when I broke in the league in 93 that uh, you, you need the, those strong leaders in the locker room to kind of help, uh, you know, balance the group out. And yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, you mentioned social media, you mentioned the fact that now, you know, athletes have so much more thrown at them um, when they're, they have to, you know, you got to focus, you got to be able to play, you got to, you got to be able to get it done, you know, whether that's on the ice, on the court or on the field. Right. But at the same time, you have this extra, these extra pressures, you have these extra opportunities as well. Right. I mean, you have this opportunity to, to build your personal brand and do, do all the things that you can with social media and marketing, you know, do you, how do you, how do you help younger players or younger athletes or talk to them about those extra pressures that they now have off the, you know, you know, off the ice. 
Yeah, no, I think when you think of social media, the one thing that I do tell them is first and foremost, it's great you're on social media. It's great you're interacting with fans, with other athletes, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if you don't play good, it all doesn't matter. You have to focus on being the best player you can be, playing at a high level, continuing to excel and get better and, and succeed. And if you're not able to do that, if you lose focus and lose sight of what you're there to do, which is to play a sport and play at a high level, then all the social media stuff and all that really kind of goes out the window. It, it really doesn't matter. In the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter because you need to play your sport to the best of your abilities and then continue to get better. And I always felt when I was playing, it was going to be time for me to retire when I was no longer learning. You know, when you stop learning, whether it's business, sports, as we talk about life, you, you, you're a dinosaur. You're, 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 you're going backwards and everybody else is going forwards. And uh, so, you know, the, the simplest answer that I give to guys is, you know, if it's getting in the way of what you do, then you need to slow down and focus. Your focus needs to be on playing and winning because that's what you're there to do. And then once you're able to manage that and handle that, then you can start adding this other stuff. You know, when you're an 18, 19 year old coming into coming into the league, there's a lot, as I said, going on. And there's because of social media, there's even more pressure and even more eyes on you. And you need to understand the magnitude of every keystroke. Everything you say is now scrutinized and, you know, monitored. And, you know, yes, it can be monetized, but one slip up and the monetization goes away like that. So it. it it can be a double-edged sword. It can be a, a great asset and a great tool, but you really got to focus on why you're there, I think, initially, and, and kind of slowly dip your toes in and and, and kind of move along in, in that space, in the marketing space. Um, you know, I think you look at some of the best athletes to ever play the game. You know, you look at Tiger, you look at, you know, Tom Brady, you look at um, Michael Jordan. In the beginning of their careers, they were very slow to do marketing deals because it was all about winning and all about playing the game. And as they got more comfortable, as they got uh, better in their craft, they then started to add these different layers of marketing and, and get more involved in all of that stuff because they were comfortable in playing. And, you know, the, the longer you go in a sport, the easier it becomes to a certain extent because you don't – you still have to put the time in, but there's you're not learning – on such a massive scale, you're able to just add pieces to the puzzle and, and you're able to veer your attention away from what it is you do sometimes because of that. It's a tough balance. It's a really, really tough balance as a professional athlete. And, and, I don't, and I don't envy any of them with, with those types of <laughs> things. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's hard enough to do your one job, but you got to then do these other yeah. things really, really well as well. So Again, Chris, it's it's awesome having you on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And, you know, one of the things that um, it has been fascinating to, to, to think about, you know, when I was getting ready to, you know, in preparing for to talk with you about this, and all the things that you've done and just the teams you played for, whether it was Hartford and the, the Blues, the Oilers, the Ducks, the, I mean, winning a Stanley Cup with them, you know, out on the West Coast must have been unbelievable. And then, you know, then, you know, wrapping up your, your career with the Flyers. I mean, were there any specific moments um, like we have on the screen right now, you know, holding up the uh, the Stanley Cup? Um, were there certain moments in your career that you think back now and you're like, wow, that was just amazing. I, I, I'm i so happy I got the opportunity to do this or achieve this, these types of things. Yeah, you know, there, there was a few. Um, you know, that one there was the culmination, of, you know, having been in game seven in the Stanley Cup finals the year before with Edmonton, and then to be able to get right back to it uh, the following season with the Ducks and then ultimately win, uh, you know, it's a huge relief. I think I was 30, whoa, let's see here, I was, uh, I was 32 at the time. And, it, you know, you get to a point where you start, okay, how many opportunities are you going to have? How many, you know, a lot of those guys that were on that team, especially the young guys, Perry, Getzlaff, some of those guys, they haven't been back to the final since. So, you know, I remember our, our defensive coach, Dave Farish, was saying that his first year in the National Hockey League, 
he got to the finals with uh, I think it was the New York Rangers, and he's thinking, oh, this is easy. I'll get back there again. Never got back. You know, had a ten or twelve year career. So, you know, you, as a young kid, you think it's you think you're going to get back there every year. You think it's not necessarily easy, but you think you have a good enough team. You think and you know, from year to year, I always tell people, oh, we got the same team coming back. I go, yeah, you do, but either A, you're one year older, or B, you're – not everybody has a career year at the same time. You know, players do this. It's just, the you know, nature of the beast. Um, other teams are getting better. Other teams make moves. You know, there's all – there's so many different pieces to the puzzle as to who's going to win and who's – you can't automatically bet that, oh, they're, they're going to go back there. They're going to go. It just, our sport specifically, hockey, it's so hard to win the Stanley Cup that the teams that are able to repeat, it, it's it's rarefied error, especially in this era with parity and and kind of where things are at. It, it is unbelievably hard. And, um, you know, a lot of things have to go right for you to win. I know that that year in particular, uh, we, we had a number of guys have career years. That and that team was awesome in the sense we could play, we could beat you five, six, five. We could beat you two, one in a defensive effort. We could beat you up. We could, you know, we could play a tough game. We could play a finesse game. We could play a high scoring game. We could play a tight checking game. You know, we could adapt to any style of play that we were playing against. And, you know, that's what made that team specifically one of the, the funner teams, if not the funnest team I played on is, just so much depth and, and variability to how we played the game. And, uh, you know, we played at a high level all year long. You know, the interesting part about that year, I got hurt and Scotty got hurt. Scott Niedermeyer got hurt around the same time. And we went on a little bit of a slide. We, I think we lost like nine of 10 and, you know, it was at the time in February where it was like almost like a kick in the can kick in the butt where, you're figuring out, okay, we, we do have a certain way we got to play. We got to play an, an in high intensity game. We got to play a physical style. We have to, that's our game. And, and I think it allowed us that detour through part of the midway through the year to kind of, okay, we can't take nights off. We can't coast. This is a style of, of hockey that we play. This is how we're successful and we have to keep playing that way. And, you know, I think when you go through that and you have leadership in your locker room that, hey, guys, this is how we do it. This is our blueprint to win each and every night. And then when you're able to go out and guys buy in and guys have that belief in the locker room that this is how we win, and then they go out and produce and perform and play at that high level, it's a lot of fun to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. And really, really, you know, great, great advice, great stories. Um, you know, these are the types of things that I think have been – really amazing is what we've been able to do, you know, here on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Again, Chris, so thanks so much for joining us on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And these words of wisdom are things that are that are not only helpful in the from the sports world, but really translatable into the business world. And I think that, um, you know, these types of um, you know, this type of advice is incredible. I mean, it, while playing in the NHL, were there any businessmen or owners or people that you got to know or got to get close with um, that you played for. <laughs> Sorry, no, <it's>, hey. <laughs> doesn't matter. These days, it's you're in the middle of a global Sorry pandemic. Of course, <laughs> nothing matters. <laughs> um, so you know, were, were were there were there some owners and 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 executives um, that you got close with that you felt like they, they were were helpful to you? You know, I always. I always tried to talk to the GMs. I always tried to, you know, I, I, I wanted to have that separation of powers with, you know, I didn't want to be too friendly with the owner. Just people get traded. People start, you know, they think, Oh, you're going to the, you're going to the owner. You're going to, the, you know, I, you know, I, I wasn't a big fan of that. Um, you know, I think I'm a firm believer in owners own managers, manage coaches, coach players, play, Everybody has their role and, and much like a business, everybody's got their role. Everybody's uh, got a job to do. Uh, I, as a player, my job was to play and, and help the team win and be successful and, and play to the best of my abilities. Um, you know, having said that, 
there are a number of people that I met along the way through my travels, especially here in St. Louis, uh, which was my longest tenure, but I got to meet a lot of businessmen in the community, uh, business women in the community, and you know, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, a number of them are great mentors to me, and in, in you know how how they manage, to how they run their businesses, uh, how they look at certain deals, how they look at uh, growing their business, um, how they look at their staff, and and how do they invest in their people, uh, how do they train their people, and you know, there's always, I was always asking little questions about that. Uh, I've always been interested in business, interested in, you know, running my own company and, and kind of being my own boss and, and, and that type of stuff. And so I was always very inquisitive and in asking questions about that. And, and when you have mentors like that and you have people that are willing to help, you know, the, the year in Philly when I got hurt, you know, and I was, you know, it was over. I knew it was over. I was just like, all right. I called a couple of couple of dear friends who were mentors to me. And the moment I called, they were on a, he, one of them got on a flight, was at my house the next day in Philly. Uh, the other one was, uh, I was at his, I flew to his house uh, a couple of days after that. And just listening to, you know, okay, your career's over. Don't rush into anything. Don't, uh, agree to do, you know, whether it's, you know, a charitable endeavor or uh, invest in anything, take a year off. Don't, uh, you know, it's all going to be brand new to you. There's going to be a lot of things thrown your way. They're going to sound interesting at the time. You're not going to be able to do the proper due diligence. You're not going to be thinking clearly. You're going to be anxious to get started doing something else. And, and it was absolutely perfect advice because that first year I just worked on getting healthy. I kind of, I, you know, I read books and kind of, you know, kept myself busy in that regard, but just really focused on my health and focused on getting better and focused on my family. And then from that, everything really started to open up and you could kind of see things a little bit more clearly and, and you can see things, uh, how they fit into what you want to do, what your interests are, uh, what you want to get involved in from a philanthropical sense, uh, from a business sense, uh, from a hockey perspective. And, and you know, I st was still working, being paid by the Flyers and, and helping them with some scouting and helping, uh, you know, on player personnel stuff. And, you know, it was uh, nice to kind of stay involved to, to a certain degree where you feel like you got something going on and, and you're able to kind of keep your mind occupied. But at the same time, you know, I was I spent probably two and a half years focusing on my health and trying to get my eyes better and trying to, you know, work on my head and, and get that back to the best it possibly could get uh, for me and, and where I'm at and how I'm living. And, um, you know, so I think when you have good people around you like that, that you trust and, and you really look up to and, and, and respect. You, you really take to heart what they have to say because, you know, both of them had retired and, and went through exactly what I was going through, not necessarily at my age, but, you know, at, at that inflection point of, of understanding, okay, what's next? And, uh, and when you have people like that that are mentors to you that, that go through a very similar process and, and ha you're able to learn from what they went through, uh, you're, you're – you're in good hands and, and everybody needs to have people like that to lean on and trust and, and help them through whether it's a difficult time or help them through finding that next thing. Absolutely. And one, and one of our, our, our mutual friends is, is Peter Luco, who was ran the flyers when you were with the flyers and someone that you did some, some other, other business with afterwards, right. As well. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Uh, you know, Peter was, was instrumental in, in uh, getting me down to Florida and introducing me to Dale, who I knew casually to say hi to, but I didn't really have a relationship with Dale. I didn't know him on a personal level. You know, I knew who he was and 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 had met him a number of times, but uh, you know, started talking to Dale uh, through an introduction from Peter, and and you know, formed a relationship and and started talking about hockey, started talking about uh, you know managing and and talking about. Uh, uh, you know, really the game of hockey and, and, you know, what I was interested in doing, would I be willing to help him? And, and that's kind of how I got down to Florida. Yeah. I mean, going back for a second, I mean, 
What was it like when you got that call from the Hall of Fame? <laughs> it's an interesting story because I was at uh, I was at Albert Pujols charity golf tournament, and I was playing in a foursome with four deaf guys. Oh my god! And but the, the crazy part is that I get this phone call. We're in the middle of a hole. I get this phone call. I said, "Sorry guys, I just got to take this." I walk over, you know, I'm like 20 yards away and I'm talking on the phone and I'm like, oh, thank you. Appreciate the phone call, John, John Davidson. I'm like, oh, thank you for the call. Uh, this is great news. I appreciate it. You know, blah, 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 blah. Thank you for welcoming me to the Hall of Fame. And I, I walk back to the golf cart, put my phone down. And my cart mate looks at me and goes, oh, I read your lips. Congratulations. <laughs> wow. You know, and you're like, oh, I said, he's like, oh, don't worry. I won't say anything. <laughs> I had to do uh, media stuff the next morning uh, during the, the official announcement. So it was uh, an interesting way to get the call. But uh, uh, it was a uh, 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 tremendous honor to be called by, by John Davidson and Lanny at the time. And, and then to be inducted with the group I was with Nick Lidstrom and and Sergey Fedorov, Phil Housley, and, and Angela Ruggiero, and then Peter Kamanos in the in the building, uh, the builders category. I think was uh, you know a fitting group. Uh, obviously played against uh, Sergey a lot when he was in Detroit, and and a few of his other stops. Obviously Lidstrom, his whole career, and and obviously a, a number of Olympics that uh, Angela was at, I was at as well. So uh, and then Phil. So you know when you're going to your peers like that, and you go in. Uh, uh, I think there at the time there might have been 278 people uh, that had been inducted into the hall at the time. Uh, you're in there with a select group, and uh, uh, you know the the honor and and privilege it is to to be called a hockey hall of famer, and and uh, it's it's tremendously humbling and something that when you're playing a sport you don't oh I want to be a hall of famer you think I want to play hockey you know your passion is about the sport about the game about playing and. And even as you're going through your career, you're you're not. At least I wasn't playing to be in the Hall of Fame. I was playing to be the best possible player I could be. And ultimately, if that's meets those standards, then you know that's incumbent upon the selection committee to see that. But you know, I just wanted to be the best player I could be and and play the best hockey I could each and every night. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, we you know your your era in the, in the people that you played with. You played with some incredible players. Um, I mean, and, and one, I, I, I have to have to ask. I mean, you you played with the great one. You played with and against. <laughs> yeah. right? um, well, 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 tell tell us about him a little bit. You know, I, he came to St. Louis at the perfect time for me. I had just been traded to St. Louis, and that whole year I got traded for a fan favorite, Brandon Shanahan. So that whole year I was getting booed. It was, <laughs> you know, they were upset that I was there and not Shanny, and on and on and on. We traded for Gretz, I think it was late February, maybe early March. And he came at the perfect time because all the spotlight left me and, and was thrown onto Wayne. And, you know, from the media to the fan scrutiny to, you know, or the fan adoration in, the, in this particular case. And, and then, you know, it just, it gave me a chance to kind of find myself again, get back to my game, realize how I need to play to be successful and also watching how Wayne handled the notoriety, how he handled the media, how he handled the, the fanfare, you know, how he held himself in high esteem off the ice, how humble he was and, and, and what a good teammate he was. And I think when, you, you know, when you're the best player in the world and you're able to, you know, <laughs> you know, he was at the tail end of his career. I think he played four years and you're able to kind of see him in that element and able to see him take it all in and just, you know, be water and kind of mold with how everything just happens. And, you know, it, it, it really, I think, truly helped me as I went through my career the next few years and, and having seen how he dealt with everything and, and how we prepared for, you know, prepared in practice, how he played, prepared for games. And you're able to see things, you know, how he was, you know, I was very intense and took losses to personally. I took them personally. And I, you know, you have to be able to turn the page. You have to be able to 
get past the loss and focus, refocus on that next one. You know, there's always that next one. And when you dwell on these losses the way I was, it, it can tire you out. You know, the, the first couple of years I was here in St. Louis, the first couple of years in Hartford, I took losses so hard and, and so personally that you beat yourself up. You, I could have, you know, if this one play didn't happen, I could have changed the outcome of the game. Or I could have did this. And it just wears you out. It, it grinds on you and you're, you're not able to stay as fresh as you should be. And from a mental perspective, more importantly than the physical side. And, you know, once I was able to kind of get past that and, and, and really understand how to, okay, learn from, turn the page and now refocus and, and get, get back to work. Uh, my game and, and my consistency level got that much better which is what everybody's looking for is to play at that high level on a consistent basis, night in and night out. That's a great lessons that you were able to learn from Wayne and, and, and what he, what he was all about. And he looked like, you know, you see, you see someone like magic Johnson who played basketball, it looked like he was having fun. He smiled a lot. It looked like Wayne was smiling on the ice. Is, is, is that, is yeah, this- I mean, you, you could see he has, and when you hear him talk about the game of hockey, he has a passion for it. He has a love for it. You can see from his old clips when he was a kid, just the joy and the the passion he had for the sport of hockey and the game of hockey. And when even at that level that he was at, he still loved to strap on the blades and go out and play and and have fun. And, you know, I think that's sometimes what separates those guys at that level to others is their ability to, to just – the pure enjoyment of playing the sport and, 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 and the passion that they have for it comes out in the way that they play and the way that they interact with their teammates on the ice and interact with the other team and interact with the coaching staff and the referees and the fans and, you know, the, the media at the game, you know, there's so many things that uh, if you're really paying attention, you can take away from some of the greats of the game. And, you know, whether it's Wayne, Michael Jordan, uh, you know, now Tom Brady and, and LeBron and, and, you know, all these different guys that, that are at the, the height of, uh, of being the best in their sports. And you're able to see how they live their lives on a day-to-day basis, but then how they interact with their teammates, how they manage life outside of the sport and, and the type of passion that they have for the game that they play. Well, it's, it's, it's really, really great stuff, Chris. And again, it's, it's awesome to have you on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And now, you know, you and your wife are, are entrepreneurs. You have that passion for, for business, for doing something really interesting now. And, and you have a luxury travel business where, called Well-Inspired Travels. I'd love to hear what you're, what you're doing with that and, and kind of what are some of the exciting things that are going on in, in, in within with that right now? Yeah, you know, it's you know, we're right at obviously with COVID and everything going on, it's not the ideal time to be uh, you know pressing forward in the travel industry, but <clears throat> we're firm believers in in growing organically, growing this is a long-term plan, it's not short term. We're not looking for a quick fix and and, and a quick hit. We're we're looking to build our team, build our business and, and build our client base with the right people, uh, you know, because we, we believe in travel. We believe in the healing powers of travel and, and what it can do for you uh, from a mind, body, spirit perspective. And uh, this has been a labor of love for my wife for a very long time. Uh, I also enjoyed to travel, uh, you know, growing up and, and, you know, throughout the course of my career. And, and now with, with where our kids ages are at and, and we're, you know, finishing my career and, and where everything is at in, in life, you know, especially from a health perspective, uh, the timing was just right. You know, my wife wanted to get started and, and we, we'd kind of been doing something to this effect for a long time. Uh, and, and ultimately a couple of years ago, my, my wife wanted to, to jump in and, and start something. And as I said earlier, I've always wanted to, to run a business and, and be my own boss and, and build something from the ground up. And, uh, well, you know, when I really started talking to her about it and, and talking about the direction and, and where we could take this, 
you know, I started to get excited. I really started, you know, and then the ideas start flowing and you start brainstorming and, and start talking. And, and, you know, when you have that kind of passion for something, it's 24 seven, you're just, your mind's constantly going. And I think, you know, I had a lot of questions when I, I didn't resign with the Florida Panthers. And, um, you know, I think for me, it was, I, I, I really saw something, ability to, to be around my family more, uh, you know, build a business with my wife. And, and, uh, and I truly believe in, in what we're doing and in, in what travel can do for you. And, and, you know, our business model is a little bit different than most. Uh, you know, we're more about relationship with our clients and really getting to know them and understand them. Uh, having been an elite athlete, having lived, uh, you know, I know what elite athletes need and want. I know what a CEO or a C-level executive wants. I know what a business owner wants in the sense that I know the demands in their time, the pressures of their job, the demands in their family life, uh, the strain and pressure on their kids, um, you know, I, and, and to be an elite athlete, a CEO or a business owner at, at that high level, you, the drive and desire to get to the top, I understand. And then the, the will and determination to stay there and then go above and beyond. There's so many parallels amongst that group. That's kind of how we figured out who our niche was and that's because that's what we know. That's who I know. That's, you know, from a spouse perspective, that's what my wife knows from a family perspective and we get it and understand what they're going through. And we firmly believe through travel from a health and wellness perspective, when we talk about mental health, we talk about physical health, we talk about all these things. There's they're out in the stratosphere more now than ever before the pressures and, and demands on our time travel in our opinion is very important to to taking you back and and really helping you become that that better leader to de-stress to learn new sleep techniques it, it can be as simple as that and your ability to you know we're, we're not about you know how many people do you know now that go to a beach sit on a beach for seven days do nothing and then they come home I don't know very many that do that anymore. You know, you might sit on a beach for a day and then you're going to go do an adventure. You're going to go do something else. You're going to learn about different culture. You're going to go on an adventure. You're going to try different culinary. And, and we're firm believers that you can come back from your travels and implement what you learned into your everyday life so that you can continue to grow and expand your, your mind and expand your, you know, whether it's de-stressing, uh, can, reconnecting with your spouse, reconnecting with your family. There's so many different avenues you can go down with what we do. And because we're getting to know and understand our clients on a more personal level, we're then able to mentor and guide because I've been through everything that they've been through and understand that. And you're able to help guide them in different directions. Say, you know, you hear, you're, you're listening to people more. You're, you're really asking probative questions and peeling back the onion onion and, and, and peeling back the layers and listening. And, oh, maybe there's stress. There's a stress point with the kids. And you're like, hey, you need to take a family trip. You need to figure out, you need some family time. You got to reconnect with your kids. Or maybe there's a hot spot with your spouse. Like, hey, you need to, you guys need to get away for a long weekend. And, you know, here's a great spot where you can go to the spa. You can do this, you can do that. And it's about understanding them and then directing them to the right property, the right location, the right area to learn about culture, learn about uh, culinary, learn, you know, whatever your interests are and desires are. And then as you continue to go, you build out their profile and you, you, you start knowing that, but also having been an athlete and been very protective of our privacy and our family life, we're very discreet. We're very uh, understanding of people's privacy and, and, discretion and, and how we communicate with people. All of our clients are siloed off. Uh, we talk internally, obviously, about, you know, with, with the group that's handling the trip. And then, you know, I don't need to use, I don't name drop. We don't use people's names. I don't need to use somebody's name to get this client over here. And if I do, I don't want that guy as a client or that girl as a client. It's just, that's not what we do. That's not how we manage our business and, and run our business. So, you know, I think having that knowledge and wherewithal of of that type of client really allows us to to understand and know what they need and uh, we feel like we can uh, 
uh, allow them to enjoy their travels more. I mean, it's five star. It's high touch, high service, uh, uh, turnkey service that that can allow you to leave your house and not have to think till you get back to your house, and everything is handled for you. So, um, you know, we're excited about you know the conversations we've had with uh, with a number of people, and you know, as as you know, we get through COVID here and, and get through everything and travel starts coming back slowly and, and people will start, you know, traveling overseas and, and, and actually getting back to doing what they love. Uh, you know, I think we're positioned and, and in a great spot to uh, to take advantage of what we do and, and how we do it. Because uh, in, in our opinion and, and based on uh, what we've researched, uh, nobody is doing what we're doing because a they're not me <laughs> and b they're not my wife uh, with the knowledge that we have and then how we do it um we're not sure that there's anybody out there that's doing it this way well I, i'll tell you something well inspired travels uh will be successful because everything that you've done everything you've touched everything you've worked on um, worked hard on has has been successful in your life and i could just you know tell through your passion and and what you shared with me, with you and your wife and, and your team that you've put together here to build this company, Well Inspired Travels, is going to be successful. And, and I recommend it to to all of our, our listeners and viewers out there. If you want to take a, you know, a high, high touch, five star type trip, as you said, when when things when things get better out there in the world, <laughs> reach, reach out to Chris. Um, it's at well um, underscore travels and um you can uh, on that's Twitter, Twitter and, that's Twitter or wellinspiredtravels.com there at the bottom. Uh, and, uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn and we'll have a conversation. Well, you're, you're one of our new sponsors. I love it, Chris. This is great. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, no, this, this is awesome. This is really great. I just, I, I love the passion that you have for this. I love to hear all the stories about what you, you talked about, you know, through your career as a hockey player. I mean, Incre incredible career. I mean, as, as we talked about earlier, in, in, in rarefied air, winning unbelievable championships. Um, you know, this you know, just getting a Stanley Cup and be able to hoist that over your head. I can't even imagine what that feels like to be an NHL Hall of Famer. Um, it's incredible, and and you're young, and you have so much more to go do, and and, and you're doing that with well inspired travels. And it's really been a a, a pleasure having you on the show, and just uh, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Right. So this has been another great edition of our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Again, my name is Wayne Kimmel. Our producer is James Santor back at the station or wherever he is today in this COVID world. <laughs> Thanks for everything you've done. You can always follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, subscribing to our, 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 um, our all, the, all the things that we do, as well as on our podcasts. You know, download our podcasts, subscribe to them, listen to all the great people we've had. We've had everybody from, you know, like today with with Chris Pronger, NHL Hall of Famer, to people like David Falk and who represented Michael Jordan and the stories that he's told us and all the other incredible guests that we've had on our Services Capital Leadership Series. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much.